right. We'll go ahead and get Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second annual conservation burning and biochar workshop. We're very happy to have you all here and very excited for our upcoming agenda. We have uh, very fascinating speakers. You're going to be able to learn about the ins and outs of burning piles of the advanced to produce biochar. And today we also will be talking to you about how to use kilns to produce some biochar. Um, first up, we have Raymond Baltar. Thank you so much for joining us, Raymond. He is the biochar project manager uh, for Sonoma Biochar Initiative Director for the Sonoma Ecology Center. Uh, he was with us last year as well. And for those of you that were not able to join us last year, we decided to come back and re reproduce a little bit of what we were doing last year and introduce a little bit of the concepts. Just a couple of housekeeping items. We ask that everybody keep your microphones and your cameras off. It should have happened automatically, but if not, please keep an eye on yourself. So we, we want to avoid uh, having uh, noise around. And also we don't want you to embarrass yourself if you leave your cameras on. <laughs> Uh, also, for questions and answers, I ask you to please um, go ahead and type your questions in the chat room, directing it to everybody. I will be keeping track of the questions for our speakers, and when the time comes to ask questions, uh, we, I will go ahead and read them. I ask you that you do this as the speaker is speaking, because we're going to have some periods of time in which we're gonna be able to pause and ask some questions and then the speaker can continue with the presentation. So ask questions, Papa, in your mind, please go ahead and type them in the chat room. We will go ahead and have a five minute break around 10 o'clock. So please stick with us for that. This workshop is supposed to go all the way into 11 a.m. It's a pretty short workshop. We hope that you enjoy it. And please help me welcome Raymond. Raymond, thank you so much. Please take it away. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Miguel. Um, and thanks for inviting me to this presentation. Uh, I think it's the third or fourth biochar related event that I've done uh, for the Napa RCD over the last five or six years, um, which definitely shows the leadership um, in offering new techniques of, uh, to the talented farmers in this incredible world renowned wine growing region. And also thanks to Ashley for filming the demonstrations and helping to facilitate this webinar. So my presentation will be done in two parts. Uh, the first will be sort of a traditional PowerPoint uh, presentation. And the second will feature a video made by the Napa RCD at a, a recent demonstration um, done at the RCD's experimental vineyard off Duhigg Road in the Carneros. Uh, I'll be doing some voiceover um, talking blended with audio during the um, recorded during the filming. Uh, crew from the uh, Sonoma Ecology Center's uh, restoration department conducted both a conservation burn and what, what we're calling a flame cap kiln burn, which is a new technique we're pioneering in California using uh, metal windshields that concentrate the heat uh, that have been developed by Kelpie Wilson of Wilson Biochar Associates. It should be noted uh, that at time, uh, times the videos have been speeded up to allow for the entire process of both burns to fit into this presentation. Uh, there'll be several brief chat uh, sections, uh, sections during which um, you can ask questions and you can actually use the chat feature to ask questions all during this. And then during, I think there's three or four sections of the video where I'll, they'll have time to answer those questions. Um, any questions uh, specifically about biochar use in vineyards, application rates, things like that, will be answered by Josiah Hunt in the next presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video here and share my screen. Okay, so uh, again, I'm Raymond Baltar, I'm Biochar Projects Manager and Director of the Sonoma Biochar Initiative at the Sonoma Ecology Center. Hang on here. Um, so the Ecology Center has uh, been around for 30 plus years. Uh, we work in uh, education. We teach a lot of the elementary school kids, all the elementary school kids in the uh, Sonoma Valley um, about ecology and the environment. And I've been working with SEC on various biochar projects since 2011. So I do want to thank our hosts, the Napa RCD, 
Napa Green, which is a great uh, organization. And uh, these kilns that I'm gonna be talking about are, uh, we received a grant from the North Coast Resource Partnership paid for by California Climate Investment Funds. And I want to give them credit for their visionary uh, support of this technique. So this is what we're trying to avoid. Uh, I think uh, this is kind of a dramatic example, but uh, you see this all throughout uh, Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley uh, um, during this time of year. And uh, what, this is what we're trying to, uh, trying to avoid, obviously. So um, back in probably 2013, um, we started um, looking around at, well, what could we do to maybe minimize this and started working um, both with Kelpie Wilson up in, um, up in Southern Oregon and others on this new technique um, called conservation burning, which is a very simple uh, sort of a top-down burn technique. Many of you have probably heard of it and I'm gonna go over that here. So um, this is a, a very typical pile um, that you see around. You see lots of smoke. Uh, these, these were newly pulled wet vines. They had not been covered. They didn't uh, have, they weren't aged long enough. And so you end up with a really smoky, horrible uh, fire. So uh, this is, these are two examples. Uh, one are vines on the right and one are just regular wooded material. Uh, showing how how little smoke escapes. These fires do produce some smoke, but uh, they are uh, drastically reduced by using this technique. And it's really quite simple to do. So we've given, given about 35 uh, trainings uh, on this technique up and down California over the last, well, since 2013. Um, we've given them up in Siskiyou County and Del Norte all the way down to the South Coast. Uh, and everywhere in between. So there's been a lot of interest uh, primarily with vineyards, but we've also uh, done forestry and orchard related uh, trainings as well. So um, these are a couple pictures of the ring of the, the ring of fire flame cap kilns. Um, they were designed again by Kelpie Wilson. Uh, they're really simple, they're portable, they're uh, sheet metal. Um, and what it does is it essentially shields the, um, the conservation burn um, and uh, concentrates the heat and uh, makes a very, very good biochar uh, and they're very simple to put together and use. Um, so again, if anybody's interested in, in this, uh, here's Kelpie's um, uh, web address and you can kind of check things out from there. Uh, this this uh, burn here was done probably about two months ago up in the USAL forest. Um, we had the Con California Conservation Corps, uh, Corps helping us out with it. They were really jazzed about this. There was a crew of 14 people and uh, they said it was the best thing by far they've done all year. So a lot of youth are, are really interested in doing something better for the environment. And this is really um, one of the ways you can do it. So what are the emission savings from this? Um, we get this question quite a bit and we've been working um, with CAPCOA, which is the sort of the parent organization of all of the uh, air districts. Uh, and we have a real booster um, down in the San Luis Obispo Air Quality Management District who's been helping us write a proposal uh, to actually get emissions tested both in, in the lab and in the field. We're working with the Missoula Fire Science Lab as well, which is a very well-established lab. And we're very excited to, to get the uh, um, emissions. We're now we're gonna be doing emissions on a control, regular burn, the conservation burn and the kiln. So we're gonna get all that really good data there. Obviously the smoke is, is cut way down, but we also wanna find out what additional emissions are, uh, are being saved uh, and prevented from, from going up into the environment. So I'm gonna let Josiah talk uh, most about um, the agronomic benefits of, of biochar, but I, I love this picture. Uh, it, it just really shows you what biochar looks like. And one of the reasons it has the characteristics it does, uh, it, it, it sort of incubates life in the, in the soil like a coral reef does in the ocean. Uh, it looks like a sponge under a microscope, as you can see. It has all these nooks and crannies where uh, moisture, water, and nutrients can be stored for uh, use over the life of the plant. And it's also a great condo for mi microorganisms.
So uh, biochar is also an investment uh, in carbon drawdown, and it's been cited as a significant natural climate solution by varied organizations, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the UN group, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the Nature Conservancy, Lawrence Livermore Natural Lab, National Lab, and others. And as you can see from this um, graphic here, uh, these were six of the, uh, by the UN, um, the, the ways that we can draw carbon out of the atmosphere. Some of them are very, very expensive and, and still sort of under development. But as you can see, biochar, afforestation and reforestation, and soil carbon sequestration, of which biochar is a form of, are the least expensive and uh, considered the most easily scalable ways to draw carbon down from the atmosphere. So uh, there's a lot of advantages to, to biochar be, beyond just the agronomic benefits. So other environmental benefits, uh, biochar has been shown to re drastically reduce nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, in one study, between 50 and 80%. Um, and since the EPA is, uh, cons considers um, N2O almost 300 times more impactful per unit of mass on climate change than CO2, that's really critical. Um, much of this, uh, these emissions come from nitrogen-based chemical fertilizers. Biochar also reduces phosphorus and nitrogen leaching in groundwater, which is a critical issue as well. Uh, charring can help reduce forest fuel loads more sustainably. We're working with a couple of groups uh, like that. Uh, biochar can help revitalize brownfield sites um, and works best in degraded soils. So biochar can be a powerful tool in any soil restoration project. Biochar in Europe, uh, actually, they're quite a, quite a bit ahead of us, but uh, most of the biochar in U Europe, according to Hans-Peter Schmidt, who's a, a well-known researcher there, uh, most of the biochar is used in uh, livestock farming. And uh, it's been shown that feeding a very small amount of biochar, one, two, three percent to cattle can reduce the enteric methane, another greenhouse gas, by about 25 percent. So again, there are all these cascading benefits to using biochar, not just putting it in the soil. Biochar is also currently uh, under study as a filtration medium, preventing agricultural nutrients from polluting local streams um, and the algae blooms that uh, result from that. And this is a um, picture of the Santa Cruz RCD has been working on a two acre bioswale project uh, containing wood chips and biochar. And the preliminary results are very promising from this. So back uh, in the fires here in 2017 and uh, in 2020, we've been trying to get funding to experiment using wattles filled with uh, chips and biochar to surround the homes that get burned that are just filled with all kinds of chemical, uh, potential chemical runoff. So we believe that uh, there's a lot of use for biochar because of its adsorptive uh, qualities to uh, help remediate uh, this issue, especially after the first one or two rains when a lot of that uh, tends to run off. So um, now we're going to kind of get into the, uh, the burning rules. This is really critical. We completely support uh, the air quality rules and uh, everybody needs to obviously have a, a burn permit. I'm sure most of you know that. Um, and we're in the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, um, so you need to go through them. You can only burn on permissive burn days, no burning before 10 a.m., and uh, no new material added less than two hours before sunset. There also may be wind restrictions. Usually winds up to 10 miles an hour are great for these fires. Over that, um, you know, check with your local conditions, et cetera. And they don't want smoke to drift towards populated areas, obviously. Um, the, the Bay Area rules um, say that prunings must have dried uh, for a minimum of 60 days. However, vines pruned after 15, uh, February 15th for integrated pest management um, can dry for as little as 15 days. However, that's not long enough for a, 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 to really season the material, so we uh, don't recommend um, doing a conservation burn with that. Um, all fires uh, should obviously burn as rapidly as possible, and that's one of the, the benefits of the conservation burn, is these fires actually burn faster than um, we found in a traditional burn. 
the minimum burn pile height must be at least two thirds the average width. And absolutely, this is really critical, absolutely no treated wood, plastics, uh, or any other non-plant material. Uh, material can't be transported from one property to another. Uh, uh, burn permits are property specific. So this is really critical, especially with the kilns. We don't want anybody throwing anything in there other than uh, just you know regular plant material. So the conservation burn in, uh, in kilns, it, it does take a change of mindset. I know that uh, a lot of vineyard managers, they're, they're used to doing the burning in a certain way. It's hard to change. Uh, this does take a little bit more planning. It takes a little bit more, um, you know, labor time and willingness to, to do these changes, but we need to, to try to start, start using these resources in a better, uh, a better way and stop looking at this material as waste material, but as something that can actually be leveraged to produce another good product. In this case, it's biochar. So you do need to plan ahead. Ideally, you would uh, season the material for three to six months. Um, and we're pushing for regulatory changes, obviously, with these uh, emissions testing that we hope uh, will all of the air districts will will have will consider this these techniques best practice. So here's some of the the, the tools that you need. Uh, we recommend for this. You probably have a lot of these and use them yourselves. But uh, uh, we use McLeod's. We found that that really works well for uh, raking out the, the char at the end. I'll show you pictures of that. Um, we use a very little amount of propane, as little as possible. We don't use any diesel or any other accelerant. You don't have to if the material is properly seasoned. Um, we, we use a, a wood moisture meter to make sure that the material is, uh, is uh, the right moisture content, which is about ideally 20% or less. Again, this is why you need to uh, season the material just like you would firewood. Uh, and you need to have a good supply of uh, dry material like really dried canes or we use tumbleweeds in one case um, to, to sort of uh, create a, an area of kindling at the top of the pile because it can be kind of difficult uh, to start if unless you have a lot of good dried material. As far as the clothing goes, um, we recommend heavy duty welding gloves. They're really great for tossing in people pieces that haven't quite been uh, burned well enough. Heavy duty boots, fire resistant clothing. Um, Nomex is really good. It's kind of expensive, but it'll last a long time and it's very protective. And it's good to have a hard hat and a facial shield as well. So uh, how, how do you actually prepare the piles? Um, in this case, um, this was Claude de Bois Vineyards and a couple of years ago, um, they used uh, mechanical uh, uh, equipment to make the piles. It's really, really important not to get a lot of dirt in the piles uh, and to make sure that all the roots have been shaken out um, because it's, uh, those will cause massive smoke plumes if you have a lot of dirt in your piles. So um, if, if it's gonna rain, I've noticed that more and more vineyards are doing this. They're, they're, they are covering the piles, um, which is really great. And, uh, and then you can uncover it again on sunny days if, uh, you, know, if you have time before a burn day. Um, this is it's kind of uh, counterintuitive, but if there is a wind, um, you wanna light the pile on the downwind side um, because one of the, uh, I don't know if my pointer will work here, but um, one of the, the, the features of a, of a conservation burn pile, when you light it on top, there's a draft that comes up through the bottom and it forces the smoke, which is being created down below, up through the flame front, which is why there's very little smoke. So it's kind of the same idea that the smoke will be, it's cooler and cooler here, and this part is partially heated and uh, will create smoke, but that smoke gets drawn up through the draft, right up through the, um, through the flame front. Okay. So uh, this, is, this is a really amazing pile. This was done by uh, Cavera Vineyards a couple of years ago. It's a, I call it an artisan pile because it was so beautifully constructed. Um, and you don't expect that most people are gonna do this, but I'll tell you, these piles burned great. And uh, let me move forward here. 
So I'll just kind of show you a quick sequence here of how these piles burned. Again, as you'll notice, the pile uh, was lit on the downwind side because the wind is going this direction and it just pushes right back into the wind. It's amazing how it does it, but heat uh, radiates in all directions. So there's no problem burning back through it. Um, so this is about 30 minutes after, the, after we started the burn. This is about one hour into the burn. You can still see a lot of the unburned pieces. This is two hours into the burn where um, you can still see some of the, the unburned pieces, but it's getting a nice ash cover. And then about two and a half hours into the burn, that's when we started to put it out. And uh, you can see there's a nice ash area. You can still see a little bit of, uh, of um, the flame down here, which is okay, but you wanna you know, wait till the pile uh, pretty much is gone from, uh, from any flame like that. And then this is about two hours and 50 minutes uh, when we raked everything out, put it out with fire. Um, they had a nice uh, water trailer there that we used. It probably took maybe 100 gallons to 150 gallons to put this out. So there is some water use needed. So what do you do with the biochar once you've created it? Um, there will be a lot of larger pieces and uh, because of biochar's uh, incredible surface area. You don't want to have great big chunks because you're just sort of wasting some of that uh, some of that surface area. So, uh, in this case, you, I mean, you can use an excavator or a backhoe to just kind of run run over it. Um, you can use a compost screen if you happen to have that. Uh, run a truck over it, or maybe ideally you would you would gather up all the biochar together, take it to a cement pad. Uh, rent a pavement roller and roll over that uh, a bit. So there's many different ways you can do it. You generally want to keep it at a, maybe a quarter inch minus. Um, it's fine to have some uh, powdered carbon as well, but uh, it's nice to have some varied sizes as well. I'm sure uh, Josiah will probably talk about that. So one of the things that uh, Cavera did, which was really cool, is they created a space on their farm where they actually conducted the burns every year. Um, and that was right next to where they had a compost operation. So it was really easy. You always want to uh, generally inoculate the biochar in, in some way uh, if you want to use it right away. You can put straight biochar into the soil if it's going to sit there for a while and acclimate to the soil. But if you want it to be agronomically active from the beginning, and, and again, Josiah will talk about this, um, you want to um, mix it with something that will inoculate it with uh, nutrients. So um, one of the good reasons to have a, a, an area on your farm where you want to conduct the burns is that it, the, these burns can damage the soil. Um, I'll show you a slide in a minute um, about that. But um, the material can season uh, away from it. You're not forced to you know, try to get rid of it as quickly as possible because it'll impact your uh, successive planting uh, plans. Um, so, you know, if possible, if you have a place on your farm where you can uh, move the piles to and let them season, that's a, that's a good solution. If you're worried about disease and you need to burn them sooner, obviously you have to do what you have to do. But where possible, uh, with planning and effort, um, uh, being able to, you know, plan ahead and season your material, uh, it will just become a better part of your sustainable farm management. So this is a picture, uh, this is a forestry operation, but um, this uh, forest here on the right, um, those burn piles were done 40 years ago and they still haven't come back. So uh, now, you know, obviously they're not tilled or uh, uh, delved or, or whatever you might do in a, in a vineyard, but this just goes to show you how uh, burn piles can impact soil for a very, very long time. And just a quick note about critters. Um, you, uh, as you all know, there's, uh, you know, the late spring is, is nesting time. Ideally, what you could do if, if you can, uh, can do this is to let your material season over the summer. And then as soon as burn season starts uh, in the fall when there isn't nesting, um, then you can create your, uh, your burn piles and, and do your burning from there. So be, be aware of the critters that might be there. We've also had people rebuild their piles um, if they have to do it in the late spring to make sure that any critters that are in there um, are not uh, gonna get burned up. 
So I, I do want to make a note that um, these techniques that were the conservation burn in the kilns are not the most efficient way to process this material into biochar. Um, and we encourage the Sonoma Biochar Initiative, uh, pr encourages and pr promotes development of uh, community-based, low emission biomass processing technologies like these here. One is from, uh, it's called ARDI, Advanced Renewable Technology International. The other is Pyrag, it's a German company. But there are a number of these um, sort of smaller scale pyrolysis units that are becoming very popular. They're becoming more, um, more affordable. And, and they also use more of the co-products of the burn uh, or heating process, um, such as producing renewable energy, bio oil, as well as, as biochar. Um, this, the Sonoma Biochar Initiative and Sonoma Ecology Center are actually working on bringing one of the RD units to the Bay Area this year. So we're pretty excited about that. However, the conservation burn and, um, and uh, the kilns are a very affordable, inexpensive way to process mater this material until some of these uh, more expensive, uh, more efficient technologies uh, come around. There's also a, another solution. This is uh, called a Tiger Cat Carbonizer. It was ROI um, until C Tiger Cat bought it. This is a large industrial uh, machine. It's, it's uh, on track so it can move around. It can process up to 15 to 20 tons of material per hour. So it's in, it, it um, can go through a lot of material very quickly. Uh, at 2,000 hours of operation per year, it could potentially process 30,000 tons of biomass with very low particulate release while also conserving approximately 1,500 tons of carbon in the form of biochar. This is not uh, an incinerator, um, and it's just uh, been considered by the EPA as not an incinerator because it does produce a, uh, a valuable product. So. Um, and this 1,500 tons of carbon represents over 3,700 tons of CO2 that's prevented from entering the atmosphere. So Dan Falk, he's a forester out in the Western Sonoma County, purchased one of these a couple of years ago and he does lease this out. So um, if you're particularly in a forestry situation or if a bunch of farmers, um, you know, you have a lot of material that you're, um, that you're going through on your farm, this might be an option. And um, large, there are also large scale gasifiers and cogen plants uh, that produce truckload quantities of biochar. Uh, and uh, Josiah uh, will probably talk a little bit about that as well. This is actually where most of the biochar comes from. It's a byproduct of the gasification um, process and uh, it can make really good biochar as well. So with that, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing my screen. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have Ashley go ahead and queue up the uh, video, and we're going to uh, talk about that for a while. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, so the first thing you need to do before you even get to e even this. Sorry, folks, I forgot to unmute myself. Here we go. stage is to make sure that the material is of the right moisture that? content, which would be 20% or less. So I have two different types of moisture Good. meters here. This one's less than $20. It's a pin type. And then this one doesn't require pins into it. Um, so what you would do, you would come in with this one, which is really cool. You just kind of touch it down to the wood and it shows that it's 4% moisture, which is fantastic. Again, down here, that's 9%. One over here, 9%. Um, you can do the edges, but it's not as critical. So if you're gonna use your pins, then you would actually just kind of stick it in and then take a reading. But I found that this type, this one is about $44, doesn't require any pins. And if the material is really hard like this, it's hard to get it in there to get a reading. So I have switched over to this type. So uh, here's a shot showing, showing how the metal sheets fit together and are secured with just bolts and wing nuts. 
Um, while the kilns were designed to be as simple as possible to assemble and disassemble, uh, we've been thinking about switching to a standard uh, standard nuts and maybe a magnetic nut driver that would speed the process uh, and probably be a little safer as well on the disassembly side. Um, so I also wanted to mention um, that we uh, started, we're going to start with this kiln burn and then go, proceed to the conservation burn. Um, so it's, um, but we, these piles were ignited uh, about 20 minutes apart uh, and managed, we managed them simultaneously. So it's possible to conduct multiple burns using either technique, as long as you have the adequate crew, safety precautions and water supply in place. So these burns took a total of about three and a half hours to complete. So here, um, uh, this is really an important part of this as well. Uh, um, we've uh, built the kiln and now we're, we're making sure that there's no air that's gonna be coming up underneath. Um, this is one of the uh, reasons that um, the kilns are so efficient. Uh, they're actually much more efficient and make better biochar than the conservation burn. Uh, this again, does take a little bit more planning um, et cetera. But um, essentially what these do is they screen the wind and, and keep the, the um, oxygen from coming in. And um, so it, it produces- Okay, so as you can see here, it's problem. just, uh, there's actually an the outer shell. Yeah, go and ahead. An inner shell. The inner shell is of heavier duty material. The outer shell is lighter. Um, it just goes together again with, with simple bolts and wing nuts. So you don't even need much equipment at all other than a crescent wrench or something to put it together. Again, we fill the uh, bottom area to make sure that no air comes in, uh, up underneath. And then um, the, the bottom up here is you don't have to do anything to it. Normally it's dirt, but it can be grass as well. And we're just going to start filling this up and then we'll light it. And then we will just keep lighting, keep putting the material in, putting the material in. It'll easily go through all of this material over here. Uh, you can actually process up to about 16 cubic yards per day in each one of these. Uh, the Ecology Center has purchased five of these and we'll have them available to assist landowners in processing material like this um, starting in about April. We only have one of them right now for demo purposes. So um, here we've kind of speeded this up to kind of show where we're going through and um, uh, filling up the kiln. Um, in the background, you can see um, the, um, the crew is actually having to go through and cut a lot of the wire out. Um, so here they're, um, they're actually uh, starting the, uh, the fire. Again, we've created a, a nice bed of kindling on the top, really dry material. Uh, and we probably used a total of maybe a gallon uh, of propane on this, um, very little. We try to use as, as little as we can. Uh, again, safety, they do have Nomex clothing on um, and you know, heavy duty gloves, et cetera. So it really doesn't take that long to, to start this, maybe 10 or 15 minutes to, to really get it going. Uh, the key to this obviously is, is dry material. These, uh, these piles were covered um, uh, very nicely uh, over the rains. And so that kept a lot of it dry and then um, it has seasoned uh, as well. So uh, again, if you would like to um, ask any questions about this process, um, we're soon gonna have uh, a bit time availability for, to answer some questions. Um, I do want to um, talk about the, the, the wire issue and the trellis wire can, um, can really present uh, workflow issues, uh, both with the conservation burn and with the kilns, uh, as it can take longer for the pile uh, and vine preparation. Uh, if it's possible to figure out a way to remove this wire at the time the vines are pulled, uh, it would make it much easier during the pile and vine preparation and during the burns themselves. Some vineyard managers have done this for our training burns and others have not. Uh, and perhaps piles without wire um, were pulled from old vineyards with no trellising versus the new trellising systems, I'm not really sure. 
Um, so while this may not be possible because of current uh, trellising practices, we've been able to work around this issue in the trainings and demonstrations we've conducted. Uh, and it does make the process more time consuming uh, for prepping uh, the kiln, especially for the kiln. Uh, the kiln material does have to be, uh, the, the kiln is about six feet across. So ideally uh, pieces should be around four, uh, four feet or so. Um, you can't really use pieces um, wider than about four inches. So that it's really perfect for vines. Um, so we'd love to learn more about how uh, this processing of the wire could be done before the piles are created. So if any of you have uh, any good ideas on that, it'd be great. So um, we kind of skipped ahead here. Uh, what we're going to do now is um, we're going to uh, take the kiln apart and then we're going to rake the coals out. We're going to show you what the biochar looks like. Um, we were, we were very fortunate to have the local uh, Cal Fire uh, folks come with their uh, water tender, and uh, we really appreciate that very much. Um, so we're, what we're doing is cooling it down, allowing us to uh, take those uh, wing nuts off, et cetera, cooling down the inside a little bit, and then we're going to take this apart. Again, it's very thin sheet metal. It's light. It's easy to transport. Get a little hot there still, so we want to kind of put it out, cool it down. It really cools down pretty quickly, so uh, it's 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 uh, it's not too much of an issue. Okay, almost there. As you can see, the posts are coming off now, where the the panels are attached. Okay, so just a uh, quick reminder to our folks, please uh, type in the questions and send it to everyone. Uh, some of you have been sending questions to Ashley directly. Uh, we may or may not see those. So if you have questions, we encourage you that you add them directly to the chat box, but that you send them to everyone instead of uh, either Ashley or me, because that way we can see what's going on there. Thank you. Okay, so, um, all right. So if you would like to, uh, to uh, ask a question, um, Miguel, if there's anything there, I want you to go ahead. Uh, this process, actually it'll, it'll, uh, it'll go pretty quickly from here, but is there a question out there? Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question is, does these cause less emissions compared to chipping and spreading material? I think somebody's asking what are the uh, reduction in, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions or smoke if you do this instead of just wood chipping the material? Okay, well, um, that's a good question uh, and we get that a lot. Um, uh, regarding the emissions testing, um, we have hired a guy from um, Washington State University, Jim Amanette, who's very experienced in doing carbon accounting, uh, et cetera. And he's going to be working with us on this emissions testing um, and comparing the kilns and the conservation burn to existing practices like chipping. One of the advantages of making biochar is that it turns up, up to 50% of that plant material into a very recalcitrant, stable form of carbon. Uh, when you chip that material, um, you have to pay for chipping, for one, and then uh, most of that carbon that's uh, contained in that chipping material will eventually degrade and go right, right back up into the atmosphere. So if one of the goals you have here is, um, is to save as much carbon as you possibly can, then this technique uh, adds to that, whereas chipping... Uh, now. Um, chipping is uh, also uh, chips are used in some of these uh, more advanced technologies. So there are certainly situations where chips uh, produced are a good thing. Um, but if you are just chipping and you know putting it out on the ground somewhere, eventually uh, that's going to degrade and all that CO2 or much of it will go back into the atmosphere. So we think uh, being able to save, up to 50% of the carbon is a, is a really good thing, especially when it's so simple to do. So here Wait, we're- Somebody we're, else is asking, what is the ideal wood moisture range you want to achieve for most efficient burn? 20% uh, or less. 
is ideal. Um, this particular material was between four and probably 12%, I think, at the, at the top. So that was ideal. And that's why we, we had so successful burns. Okay, so we're almost done putting putting this out. That's the fire chief. Our burn is complete when it's inside the kiln and you can see the bottom. I'm sorry, say that again. Somebody's asking, how do you know when it when the biochar burn is complete? When well, there's, a, there's, a the beautiful, there's a beautiful ash over it and some of it is just experience. You'll have to kind of practice. Uh, with that, but um, you'll see, and we only filled that up halfway. Uh, you can fill it all the way up and uh, make a, a beautiful um, set of coals. And it, just like the, the pictures I showed you in the PowerPoint, you get this beautiful kind of ash over it. But um, so it's, it's maybe, you know, two hours, uh, three hours into the burn. And it's something that you'll just have to practice. And we can certainly help train you uh, when the right time is. Okay, go ahead. It's asking, uh, you were talking about the diameter of the material that uh, you're putting it into the kilns. Somebody's asking if pruning cuttings will also be okay for biomass or for biochar. Absolutely, yeah. But the, the key is um, uh, you want to kind of put similarly sized material in. If you put a bunch of big stuff and a bunch of little stuff in, that little stuff will generally turn to ash. Um, be, you know, by the time the bigger stuff is is charred. So if you can, uh, you know, burn a bunch of the canes or the, you know, um, orchard clippings or whatever, you know, similarly sized material um, for one burn and then burn larger stuff in a second burn. So go, so go ahead with the video if you would. And, uh, there's other areas we can talk, uh, we can answer questions. Okay, so what we're doing here, this pile was actually created uh, before we came into this project. So it wasn't piled exactly uniformly in a way we like uh, for a conservation burn. So what we're doing is we're uh, kind of bringing it up more into a cone shape uh, and about the right height and about the right circumference. Over here, we've separated out some of the material um, which we're going to be using in a kiln, which we'll show you in a minute. Um, now, one, one important thing um, is you need to do a moisture uh, meter content of the moisture content to find out uh, if it's ready to burn. And ideally, it would be 20% moisture or less. Um, it can, some of it can be a little higher, but as long as the average is around 20%. So the, the dryness or the moisture content is actually more important than how long it's, it's seasoned. Um, but often it takes at least two to three months to season and sometimes even longer than that, depending on how much rain there's been. Okay, so uh, here they're, uh, again, they're gonna light the pile from the top. This is one of the critical differences for doing a conservation burn versus a, a standard burn. You know, we've all been taught to, you light the pile from the bottom, uh, heat rises, um, et cetera. But, and, and it's a little counterintuitive to light it from the top. Um, it's also being lit on the downwind side um, because the wind is, uh, for the most part, was coming back towards us. So um, we also built a nice uh, a bed of smaller material at the top. We used uh, actually a very uh, little amount of propane on this, again, because the material was, uh, was well seasoned. Um, so this uh, this will catch in just a minute. And uh, as we're watching this pile burn down, um, there will be time for more questions. So um, I really like the this interactive nature of this. Uh, you know, when we're doing these out in the field, Normally we have 30, 40, 50 people standing around and people are asking questions. So it's really nice to be able to answer some of these questions. So, um, okay, I think they've pretty much uh, got it uh, going. So now there is gonna be uh, an extended period where we can uh, answer some more questions. So uh, Miguel, if there are more, uh, go ahead and ask. 
Yes, so we have a couple more questions. Uh, somebody's asking if the recommendations for the moisture uh, targets are the same for the conservation burn and for the kiln, or if there's more wiggle, wiggle room for the kiln as far as having the, the material a little bit wetter. Yes, according to Kelpie, the designer, um, you can, she, she's, you know, regularly uh, burns uh, material that's 25 and even 30 percent, uh, mostly in forestry situations. Um, but um, you, you, it's just going to go faster. You know, if it gets any higher than that, a lot of the energy of the, the heat gets taken up, demoisturizing the, you know, drying out the material so it'll, it'll heat up. Um, and so we always try to, you know, ideally you would have it be both uh, below 20 percent for both. And so here you're seeing the, the pile burn down really nicely. You're but it's asking about the cost of doing this uh, with the kiln and, you know, the five workers, the water, et cetera, versus the cost of chipping um, the material. Do you think that it, it, is there a price comparison between those two methods? Well, I would compare them more to just doing your standard open burn. Um, you know, again, uh, the, the, the kilns cost about $1,000 um, plus shipping. And, um, and, you know, you compare that to, uh, to chipping. Now, the, the kilns will last, I don't know how many times, but you use them over and over and over. The labor is definitely probably more with the kiln than with the, just the standard conservation burn, because all you're doing here primarily is changing the, the way the fire is, uh, is being conducted. And then you do have to spend some time raking it out and putting it out at the end. Um, we haven't actually done, an, you know, a, 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 compare, a strict comparison from a cost standpoint. Kelpie has, I think. And if you go to Kelpie's uh, website, um, uh, wilsonbiochar.com, uh, she has a lot of information there. She was part of a study up in Oregon um, that did, did do some comparisons. So you can find some information on that in, on her website. But uh, the kiln definitely, because it, the material has to be uh, cut down um, and managed, you know, you have to continue to fill it. Um, it's a different process, uh, but it is more efficient. If your goal is to is to make as, as much biochar as you can, uh, really high quality, then the kiln is the way to go, which also reduces the smoke, which is, again, what we're after here. Um, but if you, you know, if you just want to, to adapt your burning, open pile burning technique, um, to a cleaner way to do it that also produces biochar. Uh, the conservation burn is a very simple way to do it. Okay, so it's just burning down really nicely here. We do have one more question. Okay. Uh, Someone's asking if it is possible to overburn the biochar and ruin it by reducing it all the way to ash. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a good question too. There's sort of an art to when you put the piles out. Um, we have found over the many that we've done that we generally like to wait a little bit longer than we think. And again, it's sort of more art than science. Uh, if you just you know let that pile burn all the way to ash, that's what you're going to get. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is to to get a fine line between when that material is ready is really ready to be put out and you're saving most of the carbon versus getting a whole bunch of uh, burned pieces uh, or partially burned pieces that you have to reburn. And we'll show you that here because the, the, the kiln burn was really clean. If you can remember, there were very few uh, unburnt pieces. It was very efficiently burned uh, or burning is a, is a bad term. It really bakes it more than anything else. And that's what's happening underneath this pile right now is the, the char is being, the, the material is being uh, baked um, rather than charred. I mean, I'm sorry, rather than burned. So yes, um, you can let it go too long and it, it can ruin the char. We do not have any more questions. Uh, so if you want to, um, well, actually we just got one more. Uh, can you explain why you close off airflow at the base of the kiln? How does that make a more efficient burn versus an open conservation burn pile? Well, it cuts off the oxygen uh, from coming up. So 
Uh, it's called a flame cap kiln because what happens, uh, as you recall, there was you know a good flame over the top that prevents the um, the oxygen from going down in and creating more ash out of the char. And instead you just get that, it's all cooking underneath that. So if you had uh, air coming up underneath it, uh, then uh, it wouldn't be as an efficient cooking uh, tool and uh, more of the char would burn up. So it's a, it's a way to, to concentrate the heat. And, um, and again, it's, it's just a, it's sort of like a windscreen basically is, is what it is more than a kiln. Um, and it just keeps the air from, from, uh, from um, coming up underneath. So that is an important aspect uh, to it. I've never actually done one where we didn't do that. So uh, that would, might be a good comparison at some point, but Kelpie has always uh, recommended doing the, uh, filling the, the dirt around the base. So now we're, we're just getting a, 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 nice, uh, a nice pile here. We're still probably at this point an hour out. Okay, so that was a quick hour. <laughs> um, so now what's happening is the, um, the, the hose person um, is sort of working with the team to cool down the, the, the pile. Uh, again, unfortunately, you know, there was so much wire in these piles it required us to come in with bolt cutters and actually cut the wire away. Um, and uh, again, this is why it would be nice to find a solution to that to get it, the wire out beforehand. Now I know that you know might sound like a difficult process, but if anybody's out there who's creative and could think of a solution to that, it'd be great. Now there, I picked up the hose <laughs> because it's really, really important to watch your hose. Uh, it's really easy to get to get it into the pile if you're not watching. So always make sure that you, uh, you have an assistant around the hose person so that uh, it doesn't burn your hose. I think we burned one hose once. Um, so we're just kind of going around the pile, working in towards the center. Um, this pile, again, was created with a, a, a backhoe or a loader or something. And um, we found out once we kind of put it all out that there in, in that mound in the center, uh, there's a bunch of dirt underneath it that was pushed together. So that's why it actually looks like it's a, it, it's more char than it actually is because there's a lot of dirt under there. So uh, again, the pile technique on how you uh, actually do make the piles is really important. Um, and it's a little change of uh, mindset about, uh, you know, saving that carbon and doing as much as you can to reduce the, uh, reduce the labor. We have five minutes left, Raymond. Oh, okay. Okay. If you, okay, so if you Do you want, want me to speed it up a little bit, Raymond? Yeah, if you want to go ahead and move forward. Okay, you tell me when to stop. Okay. Yeah, so go ahead forward to that. There we go. So here with the pile, you see that there's a lot of unburned pieces. It looks very different than the kiln pile. Um, part of this is because it wasn't combusted uh, evenly. Uh, and so you end up with you know a lot of wire and stuff. Now that's fine. You can pull all that stuff out. It's just uh, a little bit more work than it is with the kiln, which is again, more efficient. Uh, so go ahead and go forward. Yeah, so um, now we're at the stage where we've actually put out both of our piles. Um, this was the pile from the kiln burn. And as you can see, it's really pretty clean, uh, really nice char. This is some that was made from it. You can see how it, it breaks apart really easily. That's a sign of good, good biochar. Um, so this pile is cleaner than this pile up here, primarily because we uh, we were able to kind of go through and cut up the pieces and take some of the wire out. The pile up there has had more wire in it, uh, and it was also a bigger pile. And it, so the, the advantage of the kiln is that it makes a very nice uniform product, um, a very nice uniform biochar. Whereas when you, as you can see up there, 
um, there's still a lot of unburnt pieces and things like that and that's what you don't get when you with the kiln so if your purpose is primarily well twofold to cut down on the smoke but also to um, to produce the biochar the kiln is really the way to go it is more work um, it does take a little bit longer but uh, if what you want is the biochar at the end this is really a better method of doing it um, the char that's made in the in the conservation bird pile is also good good char but it's generally um, not as consistent and uh, as you can see up there there's a lot of material that wasn't burned now you can still take that material pull it out and put it on your next burn pile and then you know you can continue to use it all up but this is just a cleaner product overall okay so if I, do i have any time left or not we can just uh, go on to josiah from here uh if i have time. two minutes two minutes Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen then real quick. Okay, so I just want to leave you with this. Uh, I love this picture. Um, you know, this is really, we have to change our, our mindset about what waste is, you know, all across our society. And, you know, these simple techniques are just one way of repurposing the material that we just used to, you know, burn up and get rid of. And, you know, that causes CO2 release, it causes smoke, etc. So why don't we just learn how to, uh, how to utilize these materials uh, in a much better way. And in nature, there's no such thing as waste. It all gets used. So let's get smarter and do that. So on that, uh, I thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, hand it off to Josiah Hunt of Pacific Biochar now, who's got a lot of great information for you. Uh, we actually, Raymond, uh, we're going to take a break before we go to Josiah, and we have oh, okay. one last question for you. Okay. Uh, somebody's wondering if uh, you can use a regular size hose with a normal water pressure, or do you actually need a fire truck kind of hose? You can use, uh, we've done that before. It, it's, it's frustrating. It takes a lot longer to do. Uh, I would recommend if, uh, you know, if you're a homeowner or something and it's a small pile, yeah, no problem. But if you're trying to do larger piles like this, I would recommend renting a, uh, you know, water trailer or something. Uh, or if you have somebody with a water truck, I think most vineyards have water trucks, don't they? So maybe this person is a, you know, a smaller landowner or something. So again, you know, make your piles a little smaller uh, and then you can use a hose. Perfect, thank you so much, Ron. We really appreciate your perspective on this. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a five minute break, folks. Uh, we're gonna come back at 10.05, uh, see you back here. Thank you. Josiah Hunt, he is the CEO for Pacific Biochar. And he will be talking to us about uh, once you create your biochar or you buy your biochar, how that will benefit your overall soil health. Um, Josiah, if you can go ahead and begin sharing your screen, please. Hi, guys. Um, okay, I can do a screen share now. Okay. Um, well, we move to present mode. Okay, um, so yeah, Josiah Hunt, Pacific Biochar. Um, uh, let's see, um, I am a biochar career biochar guy now since 2000, uh, 2009, that's basically all I've been doing. Um, originally graduated with the Bachelor of Science in Agroecology and Environmental Quality. So it's not just kind of a random thing. It's the area of um, it's the area of, of greatest interest for me, um, and, uh, and 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 biochar really uh, seemed to me to be at the time in two thousand eight when I first learned about it um, some part of a missing link in our understanding of soil organic matter and you know, coming out of college in agroecology and environmental quality, the importance of soil organic matter always, and particularly when humanity is facing climate change crisis, uh, the, or, the importance of organic matter is critical 
And so if this, um, this aspect of solar organic matter, which seemed to me to be one missing link, not the only, but one missing link in our understanding of solar organic matter, I decided in 2008 that this is um, something of great interest. My initial research showed, um, you know, continued my, my interest. And that's basically all I've been doing since then. Um, so uh, today I'm gonna be showing you um, some biochar, you know, the basics, but I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have way too many slides and I'm gonna flood you with probably way too much information. If I had prepared better, I might've made it more succinct, but I, I'm just gonna have to flood you with a ton of information. Um, I'll try to do it kind of high level and, uh, and layman's terms um, so that everyone can get something out of it. Um, and uh, uh, so just kind of a, a brush through biochar, what it is and why it matters. And then also some results from one of, um, one of the, you know, the most rigorous and uh, large scale and pertinent uh, research projects, pertinent because it's with Vineyard. Um, that, uh, that we have to offer um, here in California using our biochars. Um, and uh, yeah, let's finish it up with some questions. So let me get started here. Um, so thank you, Raymond, for that great presentation. Um, and I just kind of wanted to follow up. While you're presenting that, I, I, I added a few more slides to my deck here. Um, so this is from 2012. In 2010 and 2011, there was a group that kind of did an industry survey, and um, and uh, it was Hawaii biochar products at the time. But my company was the largest producer of biochar in the U.S. I'm sorry, my dog's attacking me at this moment. She's decided it's a great moment to to play. Um, so here it is, you guys. Here is the largest biochar production facility in the U.S. as of 2010-2011 literally a cone kiln um, shaped in the earth. Uh, there's a series of them and we collected uh, sawmill residue, you know, scrap lumber from a local sawmill. And that was it. And we just did this day in and day out. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that this is, it, it, it seems kind of crazy sometimes, but it, it's, not, it's not nothing, that's for sure. You can produce a lot of good quality biochar this way. Um, and especially once you kind of um, get past some of the, you know, some of their learning curves. Hold on a second. I, I got to regulate my dog here. Um, hey, buddy. Okay. Um, so, you know, this is some more pictures from, from the old pits. Uh, we'd cover them with dirt instead of using, uh, we'd still use water, but we'd cover them with dirt to turn the fire off and then let it cool for a day or two. Um, and then go back later and uncover the dirt. And then we still add water because it's still kind of really dry and, and, and dusty, but um, it, it, it was easier. That was one of the ways we did it. And then we pull back the dirt and harvest it and like, it works, you guys, it really does. Um, anyways, we're producing biochar in, in very different ways nowadays. Uh, we can talk about that later, but uh, I, just, I just thought that would be useful. Anyways, um, what is biochar? Um, it's, it's biomass that's gone through a incredible experience. That biomass became a glowing ember. You know, the, the, the molecules are shivering and shaking and dancing so much. They're shooting off photons and emitting light. And the associations between the carbon um, are, are irreversibly changed during this process. And it starts kicking off a lot of hydrogen and and oxygen and kind of purifying the carbon. And the carbon, instead of being long chains, kind of moves into being these carbon rings. And the carbon rings are very resistant to decay. Um, I'm really sorry about the distraction here with my dog. He's, uh, he's a little bit of a puppy. And this is his favorite time, I guess. Sorry about that. Um, so that, that changing of the particles into kind of these rings, that's really critical to the recalcitrance, the, the way that this material lasts for so long because it, it makes that carbon resistant to decay. So that's happening on a molecular level, 
But if you pull back, like on a macroscopic level, like what we can see with our eyes or what we can see with a very light grade microscope, um, if you look at the picture on the right, it still looks like wood. I mean, there's probably more than one of you in this audience that could identify the species. I'll give it away, it's an oak. I'll give it away, it's a California live oak. I mean, you can see the radial lines and large pores and the growth rings and everything. Um, so that's an important fact, factor also is that the original body of the plant um, is basically frozen in time. You know, that, that physical structure does remain even though the, um, the, uh, the carbon has changed so dramatically. So uh, let's see, come on, progress, progress slide, progress slide, stops progressing slides. Come on, okay, there we go. Um, biochar is not new. Uh, the word biochar is totally, you know, that's, that's like at circa 2008 or so, 2007 maybe. Um, and it, 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 I'm, I'm literal, like, I, no joke guys. It, we would be talking, this would be the agrochar meeting right now, except somebody had already trademarked the word agrochar. Literally, this, this was where it was going. So they, they kind of made up a new mashup and it's called biochar. Um, but the material itself is definitely not new. Um, it's existed as long as fire and life, which is estimated to be about 350 million years ago when plant matter you know, populated the earth um, to a large enough degree to, to, so you have plant matter and also oxygen and this you have fire and they find this by uh, finding charcoal particles in the geological, uh, you know, in, in the sediment there. Um, how is char made? I think we've kind of gone over this. I'll, I'll try to go pretty, pretty fast here, but basically, you know, the um, gases volatilize off the wood and, you know, that, that charcoal material is susceptible to, to the combusting as well, but only in the presence of oxygen. So only when it's hot and in the presence of oxygen does the char rip apart. Um, and so, you know, the, it, it releases a bunch of gases, wood becomes char and releases a bunch of gases in the process, the gases that can be used to provide heat, energy and, and such. Um, what is biochar? Um, like where does it fit in the ecosystem? Like if it's existed for 350 million years, like why are we just calling it biochar now? And partly because it's been hiding, um, it's been hiding from our instrumentation. And so in this classic, you know, pie chart of soil organic matter, there's this big chunk here that stabilized organic matter. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know how to go back. There we go. Uh, stabilized organic matter. Um, you know, people have given it a lot of different names, but um, some big chunk of that is charcoal. And, and we know that now because we have better techniques for looking at it. But basically charcoal exists pretty much throughout the world in varying amounts. Um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not the only reason soils become dark, but very dark soils generally have high organic matter. Uh, I mean, that's generally the kind of the giveaway of high organic matter. And it's not always in parallel, but um, uh, you know, especially in this fire prone area, I'm very interested to know what some of the native charcoal content is in the Napa Valley, given that it is a small valley surrounded by fire prone headlands or fire prone, um, you know, hills and forest areas where the water's coming from. So the alluvial plains there would be a natural deposit of charcoal coming from the forests. Interesting side note, stuff lasts for a thousand years in soil. So um, I I'm very interested to know that, but basically one of the ways that we have missed this is because we do a soil, um, soil organic matter analysis by loss on ignition. You, you, you take a sample, you dry it, you put it in the oven and you bake it, or you, know, you, you, you burn it and you burn off all the organic matter, right? But that loss on ignition does not differentiate between charcoal organic matter and non-charcoal organic matter. Um, and so it takes some, some much more expensive analytical procedures to identify the charcoal portion of soil. So I think the important part, the takeaway from this is that it's not brand new to our soils, uh, which is I think is very important. And it is a natural um, part of the organic matter system. Um, and and so I, th I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, biochar and water, it's really cool what biochar can do to help with water conservation. 
Um, biochar is incredibly low density and can hold a lot of water. Um, our, you know, like basically our, our biochar can be as low as 200 pounds per cubic yard, bone dry. Uh, and it can gain weight almost seven times that. Uh, getting up to, you know, 14 or 1500 pounds per cubic yard when saturated, which is kind of a pain in the butt for shipping during the wet season. It, it can get weird, but in soil, that's a really, really great ability. That's a really great characteristic to have the ability to hold so much water and it holds water in a way that is um, unlike small clay particles, the water held to biochar is largely plant available because the surface tension is relatively low for something with such high water holding capacity, such as a clay particle has, you know, clay, a, a clay heavy soil can have a high water holding capacity, but the availability of that water is restricted because of the surface tension of those clay particles. Whereas biochar um, doesn't, it can have the high water holding capacity, but without the restrictions of such a high surface tension, restricting the availability of water. So adding biochar to sandy soils can just instantly increase your water holding capacity and also kind of resist, it kind of also reduces the, the, um, the conductivity. So it like, it makes the soil more torturous would be one way to say it. It, it. it kind of slows down the flow of water and helps hold it in there as, as well as increasing the water holding capacity. Um, with clay soils, what we found is that the biochar doesn't have much of a significant impact on water holding capacity. They already have <clears throat> a pretty high water holding capacity, so that's not you know, such a big deal. But where we find the important aspects is the plant available water can increase. So you can add, by adding biochar to clay soils, you can not have a huge impact on the water holding capacity, but you can improve the water availability. As well as, I think for, you know, for vineyards and in particular, you're dramatically improving their, the, uh, the till. You're, you're, you're opening up the soils and making them more porous. Um, that's helping with water percolation and infiltration, the ability of that rainwater to actually get into the soil. Um, and you're also, with that porosity, reducing some of the compaction and lack of air that can result in, um, you know, pathogen problems in our root zone. So um, there we go, biochar and water. Okay, come on, progress. There we go. Um, biochar and plant available nutrients. So biochar, one way to think of it is that biochar is a charcoal filter in your soil. Um, it's literally great at holding on to nutrients, capturing nutrients, and it can even capture nutrients against a gradient, meaning that um, even if the nutrients are in low in concentration, the biochar can still be pulling them out of, con out of, out of that low concentration and having a fairly high concentration of nutrients on the surface of the biochar. And what's really important is that the nutrients bound to biochar are largely plant available, meaning that the biochar is not so greedy as to grab all the nutrients and never let them go. Um, they're still highly plant available with just a little bit of pressure to pull that off. Um, so the effect is that you dramatically reduce um, leaching and reduce volatilization while helping keep those nutrients in the plant zone, or I'm sorry, in keeping those nutrients in the root zone. So here you can see reduced fertilizer leaching. Uh, that's a really important part there. Um, uh, heavy metals, it gets really complicated, but basically biochar does a great job of reducing the, uh, of mitigating the problems of heavy metals. So it doesn't poof make them disappear, but generally it can mitigate their problem causing, you know, effect there. Um, one way to think of this is just that, you know, again, biochar like a charcoal filter, kind of like a charcoal detox for a soil, the, the um, potentially toxic elements, heavy metals and other can be bound to the biochar. And if nobody wants that stuff, if nobody actively wants to pull that off, it's just going to sit there stuck to the biochar. And by what I mean by nobody, I mean like the microbes and the, you know, the soil life, it's just going to be stuck there on the surface. Nobody cares. Um, uh, so it does a great job of tying up and mitigating some of the heavy metal issues. This is a really big thing, utilizing biochar in brownfield sites. 
um, it's actually quite a growing field of biochar application where they're using biochar to uh, mitigate toxicity problems in soils with toxicity problems. Um, for instance, we're using biochar, even with vineyards, we're finding benefit of biochar in the cadmium rich soils, not because vineyards, uh, because grapes are a risk of plant uptake, but because in the root zones, um, you know, if we can reduce the pressure, it just seems to alleviate some of the um, problems in the root zones in high cadmium soils, um, as well as, you know, biochar utilization for a, a number of other things in soils that have a toxic legacy, such as excessive um, herbicide or pesticide applications uh, causing problems in your, um, in your soil microbiome or something. Any advice is great, you guys. I don't know why, but it, every time, if I sit here and talk too long, it doesn't want to progress to the next slide. Okay, there we go. Um, biochar, with a lot of these factors, biochar really helps with soil biology. Um, you know, like I showed you in some of those early pictures, the, 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 the porous nature of the biomass it was made from uh, is left intact. You, know, you still have that incredibly dynamic design uh, of the plant's um, body with the phloem and the xylem and all the tubes and tunnels going up and down and right and left and um, big tunnels and small tunnels and, and even little tiny pores on the side. It's a really, really beautiful looking material um, up close. And so all of that dynamic nature um, makes it incredible housing for microorganisms, just physical housing. Um, they can hide from predators and they can uh, have a great resource with water and nutrients. Um, so you have housing with, uh, with, with water and electricity or with water and nutrients and, and the electric, the electrical part is really interesting because biochar, particularly we produce at a high temperature can actually have electrically conductive properties. For instance, graphite is 1.5 times more electrically conductive than copper. Um, and so in biochar you have, it's not entirely graphite, but you have these graphitic type regions, little little bits and pieces, little threads, like somebody chopped up a sweater of graphene and threw it in there or something, um, little bits and pieces. And so you have electron transfer across distance and it's tiny distances. But when you're talking about microbes, that tiny little bit of a distance means a lot. And so the biochar can act as a electron um, donor, as an electron acceptor, and as an electron transfer over distance, which is crazy to think of like, I, I don't know, that's, that, that kind of science gets way beyond me, but the, the, the net effect is that it improves the, oh, what would you call it? Like the digestion or the, uh, the, the ability for microorganisms to do the work they do, changing things and you know, changing uh, you know, the, the charge characteristics of, this, of, of, of phosphorus or iron to make it more available. Um, that's just an interesting part. I, I, I'd, I'd love to learn more about that so I could talk about the electron transfer stuff with more intelligence. It's just a part of the puzzle that helps biochar um, support micro, microbiology. Um, here's just some great pictures to show the size, the scale of size here. So on the right side, you see a piece of biochar from a composting study and, and it's basically covered in bacteria and yeasts. Um, and on the left, you see uh, a very different scale. This is similar biochar, um, but on this one, you have a vascular arbuscular mycorrhizae. So this is like a glomulus uh, spore. And this is a fungal hyphae here. So you can see those fungal hyphae, those threads just plugging right into and coming out of the biochar. Oh, and I forgot to show on this, in this picture here, you can see, oh, oh you can see the, the roots going in and out of the biochar, not just going in, but you know, in and out and through. Anyways, um, so some of the important net effect of this is um, you know, biochar helping hold, conserve water, helping conserve nutrients, helping support microbial life. Um, one of the important net effects of this that has been discovered also, which is really interesting, is that when biochar is added to soil, it helps in the accumulation of other organic matter. So biochar itself is an organic matter, it's a charcoal organic matter, but when placed in soil, the net effect is commonly to 
help in the accumulation of other organic matter. So that would be these rhizo deposits, rhizo deposits like root deposits of, of, uh, of additional carbon. Um, and so biochar helped where the biochar was used, they had greater accumulation of additional carbon than where the biochar was not used. Um, in here in the US, this study uh, in, in Iowa found that the, uh, the soil carbon increased by twice the amount of the biochar carbon that was applied after six years. So basically they applied whatever it was, let's say, I forget it, four tons or whatever of biochar. They applied four tons of biochar um, and they got an additional four tons of extra carbon when compared to the control. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, that has some really interesting carbon accounting and carbon farm planning. Uh, in, uh, you know, there's, there's some interesting stuff there. We haven't developed methodologies to account for this yet, but that's a really interesting area um, that I think can dramatically improve upon the value of biochar, not just agronomically, but the value of biochar globally for um, carbon dioxide removal. And on farm, we can turn that into, uh, we can turn that into revenue with, with some more carbon accounting tools as they are developed. Um, one of the best ways to, to use biochar, it's gonna, it's gonna end up in the soil anyways. Biochar with compost is generally better than biochar alone. In almost all situations, biochar and compost applications together are synergistic in so many ways. If we're gonna apply biochar and compost together, why not just put them together at the beginning of the compost process? Um, and so we find significant benefit when using biochar in the composting process. Just looking from a compost producer's uh, standpoint, there is benefit to this. By adding biochar to compost, we reduce odors, we reduce nitrogen loss, and we make compost faster. We're able, the microbes are more effective or you know, whatever. We're not sure the exact mechanisms, but when biochar is applied to compost, it matures faster or reaches a greater level of maturity within a given amount of time, reducing odors, reducing nitrogen loss. It's, it's pretty tangible as well. Um, at, at, uh, at, the, uh, you know, at the Napa RCD site we delivered years ago, we delivered some biochar there, um, some fresh hot compost and some fresh hot compost that was mixed with biochar only three days prior. And the difference in the ammonia, at, you know, the human nose is really good at detecting ammonia. The difference in ammonia was striking. The fresh raw, bio, the fresh raw compost just hits you right up in the face with ammonia. And even just after being blended with biochar for three days, um, there really wasn't much there in the other pile. Um, and, and we notice this again and again and again, this is a, a repeated thing that we see. Uh, and during that process, the biochar is not diminished. The biochar is actually improved as well. The biochar gains uh, nutrients on its surface and organic acids and becomes complex, functionalized and ready to be, you know, ready to go to, go to town in your soil. So highly recommended. Um, I'm going to skip this a little bit. Uh, well, I guess I'm going to speak to it a little bit. I've got I, I've got some new tools we developed as far as like some spreadsheets we developed for looking at this. But um, for for just some suggested application rates, generally we're looking at two to ten tons per acre um, for new vineyards, um, depending on soil type, la la la. Uh, and budget tends to be a big deciding factor in this one because we can kind of see what's, you know, it's easier to find out what's ecologically optimal. It's much more difficult to find out what's economically optimal, uh, like for your budget. So that, that one usually kind of decides uh, some of our application rate. Um, we're finding that for new vineyards, uh, skip the broadcast. We can do the broadcast later. Just put, put the biochar right below the vine row. Um, we want to support the vines first and support the cover crop later. Um, that's been kind of what we found because uh, we can always just add the biochar down the, the middle row later. So what we found is that adding too much biochar down the middle row can actually support too much um, middle row growth almost at the expense of the vine row. So we found that adding the biochar down the vine row only at time of planting is the way to go. Um, and then in established vineyards, uh, broadcast side dress, just using biochar as a portion of the compost, something like 10% um, by weight of the compost is a great way to go, um, or 25% if your compost applications are rare. Um, some people in the Tabor grape 
uh, industry have uh, been using the French plow. It's come more common in the Central Valley and they just kind of pull the soil back, add two to four tons per acre and then put it back on. Um, and then, you know, there's been some research showing four tons per acre plowed down the middle row with great success as well. Such as in this study, this is a, this study right here. In fact, I think this one was eight tons per, yeah, eight tons per acre chisel plowed uh, down the middle row, uh, chisel plowed down, a, you know, about 12 inches down the middle row. Um, there's a dry farm Merlot in Italy, sandy clay loam textured. Um, they got a up to 66% increase in yield without significant difference in quality with this application. With a single application of eight tons per acre down the middle row, they got up to 66%. And that correlated with the worst rainfall pattern. And over the four years of harvest, uh, the average is about 37, I believe, um, the average uh, yield increase without significant change in quality. Um, so we've got some really interesting research to share from a project we're doing with uh, um, uh, Sonoma Ecology Center, uh, you know, submitted the grant uh, with UC Riverside. UC Riverside and Milt McGiffin was the PI on the initial study. Um, this was funded by the Department of Water Resource Board uh, and done right here in Monterey Pacific um, in, in, uh, in King City area. Um, and Pacific Biochar worked with all of these groups providing, um, you know, support and biochar. Uh, this, this is what they did here. So they, they, they use this, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact name. I don't want to screw it, but this machine, which if you know what it is, you know what it is. Um, and they basically plowed down a couple feet there. So the first rip, they go really deep and then they add the biochar and or compost down the down that rip row and then they go in and they rip it one more time that's this second pass right so you see the ripped ripped amended second rip and they go through and amend it in you know at depth so that's what was done with this study slick way of doing it if you ask me i don't know if that is replicable everywhere because these are kind of large fields here um, here's the plot design replicated as uh, so we had Compost, uh, we have the control with nothing added, compost only at 15 tons, biochar at 10 tons, and compost plus biochar, 15 tons compost, 10 tons biochar. Um, for for uh, treatments, four replications, half acre each. Um, you can see that there. Uh, they used, uh, you know, some of the data I'm gonna show you is from this uh, EVI, the Enhanced Vegetation Index. This is from Vineview. This is some really slick stuff, uh, in my opinion. It's, it's really cool ways of looking at it. The Enhanced Vegetation Index is a way of um, helping correct for some of the raw infrared. Um, it, you know, here they say corrects for inaccuracies found in the normalized difference vegetation index, the NDVI, which is a little bit um, you know, kind of more standard. Um, so it's less sensitive to atmospheric conditions, shadowing, and soil variations. You have five minutes left, Josiah. Sorry. What's that? Five minutes left. Oh my gosh. Wow. All right. So it's really good looking data. Um, and here we are able to show, here's the, here's the meat of it here. Um, so this is the mean of, of all treatments, right? And so you're just going to want to look at these um, bars over here as they change. Here's the compost only. So look at the, you know, the, 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 the red and the orange there. Um, and then we can see as we add biochar, more vigor. Compost only was even more vigorous. Compost plus biochar was the most vigorous. Um, here we look at pruning weights. Uh, and then here we had the harvest. This was only third leaf. This was 2019, third leaf harvest. Um, we got about a 1.3 extra ton per acre in the biochar only. The biochar only actually got the biggest harvest, even though we had less vegetation. It, it was vigor, you know, as, as shown in the enhanced vegetation index, uh, we actually got the greatest yield by 1.3 tons. Uh, fourth leaf harvest, the biochar uh, all, still got a greater above the control, um, but the compost plus biochar was the winner in this situation. So you can see here um, control versus compost and then co uh, biochar versus biochar plus compost. This is kind of the winning combo here. Um, so uh, here's some of the numbers. Um, we did great quality as well. 
uh, in the fourth leaf. Um, not much difference here. I'm not an expert on this area. I have consulted a little bit with the experts, but apparently, you know, the, the, the consensus is there isn't much difference here. Um, there is kind of a notable jump in, uh, in berry size, the berry weight volume and sugar per berry here. The biochar alone has the biggest berries um, by, you know, by a notable amount there. Uh, we did notice though in the total anth anthocyanins, um, everything else is kind of static. And then the biochar and the biochar plus compost are, are both showing uh, darker color. I, I don't really know how to assess that value, how valuable that is to you growers, but I thought it, it is in this area, we see enough difference that I thought it would be notable. And I can, you know, we can, we can bring this, some of this, if you have questions, we can refer that to Monterey Pacific. Um, who can help answer some of these questions because there is their study uh, from this point on. Um, so just looking at a basic economic assessment, uh, the biochar was $200 per ton delivered at 10 tons. Um, so that was uh, $2,000 um, in that first yield, in that first harvest, they had an additional revenue from that biochar application of 2,600. So in the first harvest, um, the biochar already paid for itself and with a $600 gain. Um, the second harvest, the, the biochar um, plot had an additional 2,200. So the 600 plus the 2,200, we got a $2,800 gain in the first two harvests as shown here. $2,800 gain paid for itself and then some already. So uh, we're looking at an impressive ROI just in the first two harvests and the biochar is gonna last a few hundred years. So we can speculate about that, but uh, we'll just have to kind of watch. Um, again, if you're going to be adding biochar and compost, the best time to do it is early in the process. Highly suggest that. Um, I've helped, you know, I think this is really important. So I, I helped, I created this spreadsheet recently to help kind of normalize or just a, as a way to look at our applications so we can have, you know, if we're applying 10 tons of biochar and this is our cultivation practice, we're going to achieve a half percent organic matter in the treated area. If we're, des if we're aiming for a half percent organic matter in the treated area, how many tons of biochar do we need? That many tons of biochar wet. So um, I think this is a pretty useful tool. Again, let's base this thing in organic matter. It's, I think it's easier to think of that way. Um, since there is only a few minutes here, um, I'll try to go through this quick. So the carbon credit thing, the carbon Biochar is achieving carbon dioxide removal. We're taking, you know, plants are capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, we take the dead plant matter and turn it into biochar, thus locking that carbon that was recently in the atmosphere into a stable form and putting it in the soil, basically like coal in reverse. Um, and just as of recently, there are accounting methodologies that allow us to account for that, get it verified, registered, and sold. Um, IPCC, uh, has, has really, you know, in the past few years, put out a lot of great information in regards to biochar, as well as their own biochar counting methodology. So here's a, here's, this is a Marin County, sorry guys, um, but not too far. This is, um, this is the first registered load of biochar right here. This is it at a compost yard, West Marin Compost. Um, and so that's happening now here. So we can provide you, effectively it, it comes out as a discount on the biochar. Um, and we know we can we can tell you how many carbon how, how many tons of carbon are being sequestered with your purchase. Uh, we're doing this with uh, high fire hazard forest residue, um, so we're helping with the forest health management efforts in California that are resulting in copious amounts of forest residue that doesn't have a good home yet in many cases, and so we're helping provide a pathway for that high fire hazard forest biomass to be utilized in a way that results in soil fertility, drought resilience, and you know, increased productivity for generations to come. Um, we have just, one more minute, Josiah. Okay, so we're, we're, we're mo what we're doing is we just, you know, again, I, I, I can't make that much biochar in the pits like I used to. Um, we're working with large scale biomass power plants where we've modified the machinery so that we can produce biochar instead of just ash. And so then we are modifying the machinery so that we can produce and harvest biochar. And, um, and by doing that, we can produce very large amounts of biochar and get it delivered to you. Um, we just load it up in trucks, 
ship it to your local compost yard or straight to the farm, till it in, there we go. Um, that is, uh, that is it, Pacific Bush, our, our goal is to leave a legacy of fertile soil. When all this is said and done, that's what we'd like to leave as our legacy. So thank you so thank much. You so much. Um, we have a couple yeah. questions here for you. Um, first question is asking if it is necessary to plow, plow in since no-till is recommended to preserve carbon in soil or is it, the, is it only applied once with no further tilling needed? Um, so definitely biochar can be used in, in no-till situations. I mean, biochar has been around for a long time. It exists naturally in our soils and tilling is a new event. So obviously there are pathways for biochar to naturally um, you know, filter in. It would just change your application rate. Uh, it would change how you would be, how much and how you would apply it. So for a no-till type situation, you would go with, um, relatively low application rates on an incremental basis. So um, little bits uh, and then the, the worms and the gophers and, and the grass and it'll all work itself in. Great, thank you. Um, have you noticed any difference in soil pests or pathogens after biochar applications? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think that it, it's, there's not, because biochar is not, it's not a chemical that's acting directly upon a certain life stage of a pest or pathogen. It's not a direct reaction. It's more of an indirect reaction. So by adding biochar, if you do it wisely, um, and in most cases, it, it's just kind of the, the, in most cases, whether you're paying attention or not, the end result is to help, is, is beneficial, but it particularly like if, you, if you're using biochar, let's say you have a, a clay soil where compaction and, uh, and, and, and you know, root pathogens are a major problem, you could use the biochar to help open up those clay soils, thus increasing the aeration and reducing the anaerobic conditions that lead to pathogens. So in general, there has been if you look across the research, the general, the, the most common result is the biochar applications result in positive outcomes in regards to soil microbial life and pathogens, but you can't say that that's always going to be the outcome because there's so many factors going on. So I, I know that was kind of vague, but I hope that was helpful. That does help. It does, it does help us get a, a perspective on it. Um, a much bigger question here, um, the past year, here in Napa, we've seen um, what it happens when we don't manage our forest properly. And unfortunately, a lot of people got affected by it. And right now, a lot of people have dead trees just lying in their property and they don't know what to do with it. So we yeah. just talk about with Raymond about how to do dead vines. And some of those concepts may apply also to just the woody material they have. But in your opinion, Josiah, working um, in this industry, what would it take for Napa to be able to produce local locally sourced biochar instead of us having to haul it in from marine or from somewhere else um, would it be possible in the near future for napa to be able to develop its own locally sourced biochar in your opinion i think what would be really useful is if if there was a local organization that could spearhead an effort um possibly getting a grant um, you know, submitting a grant proposal to, uh, you know, to, to, to get some machinery installed locally that could help with this problem. Uh, Raymond, do you know of any efforts uh, in that area that you would like to make an announcement about? <laughs> well, yeah, um, we, again, as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, going to be bringing in a sort of a medium scale biochar production facility. Um, it's going to be near Napa area, but not uh, there. I have heard that the Napa Recycling Center um, has been trying for a while now to get uh, another company to uh, build a sort of a small scale gasifier at that location. And then all of the material could be trucked there. But the problem is, is it takes a long time for permitting and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So yes, there, every community should have its own 
pyrolysis, you know, small scale pyrolysis uh, unit to, so everybody can bring that material there. So it's possible, um, you know, we'd be happy to, to work with anybody. We, you know, we've gotten a couple of good grants working in this direction. We just got a CAL FIRE grant in this regard. So CAL FIRE has been very supportive of this uh, moving forward. So I think there's some real opportunity over the next few years uh, to establish some sort of a pyrolysis or gasification in Napa Valley. Yeah, so thank you, Raymond, for, uh, you know, for getting that across the finish line. Um, and so, you know, some of the some of the biomass facilities that we're working with do accept, um, you know, they, they are working with these um, burn sites and helping in some of the cleanup. Um, but right now, there's just, uh, it's just, it's, it's imbalanced right now. There's just so much dead standing biomass in California. Uh, there's just not enough places to, to, to manage it all currently. So we've had a lot of offers at some of the biomass power plants. We've had a lot of people asking uh, if we can accept more material and, um, uh, you know, we, we need more resources. So it's great that Raymond has, has been able to succeed in getting something for us locally. Um, That's also uh, a high priority for the Napa RCD to be able to assist everybody with these with these kind of concepts. We do have a forester on staff, Amanda Bennington. If you has haven't met her yet, uh, I recommend you reach out to her. Uh, but also, my job uh, crosses with hers when it comes to agriculture because we have a lot of farming going on in forested areas, and a lot of you guys have uh, forest uh, that you need to manage. So we will be working with uh, Josiah and Raymond and moving on with other agencies to try to figure out what it will take for us to be able to do this locally because we find it extremely important. Uh, we have had conversations with the county as well because they are trying to manage the solid waste better. So they are talking to the waste management, waste management facilities as well to be able to do that. Uh, we have time for a just one more minute for a couple of questions. Raymond, here's a question for you. Somebody's asking, what is the yield of biochar per cubic foot of vines? Again, that depends on the process. <laughs> um, if you're doing a conservation burn, that's probably uh, the least efficient way. And maybe you get, maybe it's 10% conversion, um, you know, something um, all the way up to maybe 30% or 40% with the technology we're looking at. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so it really just depends in the kilns. Um, I think Kelpie, I think she thinks it's around 20%, 18, 20% conversion. But you're, so, Raymond, I think you're talking on a mass basis, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think they were asking on a uh, cubic yard. I think they're asking on a volume basis. Oh, cute boy. I on a cubic know. yard, it's kind of, you know, so, so I have, uh, being the guy, I did this a lot. And so basically it's, it's kind of like if you sent it through a wood chipper and then reduce that by, reduce that by three quarters. I, I mean, you know, reduce that by 25%. So about, you know, it's, it's basically like if you took all those vines and sent them through a wood chipper and then and then shrunk that down to about 75% of its size. That's that's generally what we found to be the conversion on a volume basis. Um, right. Thank you. And 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 just 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 you know just to not shoot myself in the foot too bad. Uh, we we'd love you know we provide biochar locally. Um, Raymond's going to have some sample material at the Sonoma Biochar Initiative pretty soon. We're going to be doing some sort of small packages um, uh, for donations or something like that. Um, we also provide material bulk uh, truckloads of it for vineyard um, for vineyard use, and you can visit our website for pricing and availability at, at Pacific Biochar. And then Raymond, how would they get into contact you with you for the um, the uh, program that you're going to do? You're going to be bringing some biochar in and selling some small bags or something. How do they? Yeah. Well, this is that? yeah. This is really for sort of small backyard gardeners at the Sonoma Garden Park. We have a uh, a process coming up where we're going to be, um, um, uh, for a donation, we'll be giving out cubic uh, foot bags and things like that with really nice blends from Pacific Biochar. So if you're interested on Saturday mornings, you can come to the Sonoma Garden Park in Sonoma. Um, again, you know, that's for small backyard gardeners. Um, at some point later this year, we may have some other availability 
Uh, but if you need, you know, large amounts, uh, Pacific biochar is definitely the way you're going to go. And with that, uh, we need to move on. Thank you so much, Raymond. Thank you so much, Josiah. We really appreciate you guys taking the time yeah. and effort. Uh, I really encourage anybody to reach out to them uh, for any questions related to biochar. Um, we're almost done here, but before I let you go, uh, we're going to have Anna Britton, the Executive Director for Napa Green, talking to us a little bit about incoming exciting news about the Napa Green program. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Uh, I, I love that there's so much potential here everywhere from conservation burning to the kilns to air burners um, to, I will say I've been in touch with Napa County. They are realistically planning to have a biomass gasification plant by 2023. So that will be a more local option for us, hopefully not too far in the distant future. Um, but we're really grateful to have been able to help um, sponsor and co-host this event. And it has added significance for us, as Miguel was alluding to, um, because we have been working for over a year to develop our new next level Napa Green Vineyard certification standards. And we are gonna be doing a soft select um, rollout of those standards next week to our current members and some other interested growers. Um, and if you haven't heard uh, that that's happening, we've been sharing a lot of emails, but I know we're all inundated with emails. Um, I really encourage you to go to napagreen.org and sign up for our newsletter. I think it's under contact us. Um, and we do, we just send those out every six or eight weeks, but it, so we try not to inundate folks, but it's a way to really keep up with what's going on. Um, and so conservation burning is one of six elements of the new Napa Green Vineyard certification. Uh, and so that's a really core piece of, of the requirements of the new certification. Um, we're gonna be uh, providing the, the sort of video step-by-step uh, -step portion of this workshop. We've also put together, um, we're grateful to Raymond, a, a really step-by-step -step written outline of how to do a conservation burn. Uh, Raymond and his team with the Sonoma Ecology Center are available to help lead trainings and burns. Uh, we definitely encourage folks to do that in partnership with neighbors because it is about $2,000 to $3,500, uh, depending on kind of the size and complexity of the burn. Um, we will be helping to host more of these workshops as well. Um, and if you do have any questions about any of this, please reach out to me. Uh, my email is Anna at NapaGreen.org. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to quickly share was just a really exciting upcoming event we have, which we're going to start promoting hopefully next week. Um, but on April 29th, we're going to be co-hosting an event with Monarch Tractor uh, focused on climate friendly and clean farming. And we're going to have a couple panels with some really great folks like Steve Mathiasen and Sophie Dricker with Raymond and, and Biomakers and uh, Nori, which is a carbon market group that we're looking at working with to make a little bit of money off of the carbon farming that we're going to be doing moving forward. Uh, so there's a lot of great things in the works, but that's going to be on April 29th in the morning. So keep a lookout for more information on that. And uh, thank you all so much for your participation. I hope you got as much out of this as I did. Thank you so much, Anna. Appreciate your perspective. Uh, with that, folks, uh, we conclude uh, this workshop. Uh, just a friendly reminder, we did record this workshop, the video will be, uh, we'll be sending a link to all of your guys' emails by Monday. And probably over the next couple of weeks, we will make it available to the rest of the public. We really appreciate your support. We try to bring you uh, concepts and new ideas as much as we can. Please reach out to us if you have any comments, concerns, if you would like us to bring a particular topic for you. We are always happy to hear from you. And uh, Thank you so much. I hope everybody has a good day, a good weekend, and I hope to hear from all of you at some point or another to talk about biochar and compost and any other topics that are interesting to you. Thank you so much.